Hey guys, so I'm gonna start a new series. I've seen a lot of people they like when I go into not the most difficult subjects, but subjects that aren't really talked about that much, but can be really important. So I'm gonna try to focus and try to find topics like that. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. This first video is going to be about ESD protection. What is it and why is it important? So here is just a simple schematic. It's just uh, at Mega 168, I don't have any of the power nets on because that's not super important. Let's say we are driving some sort of output that leaves the board or an input. So maybe this goes off the board to a switch or it goes to some sort of LED, something that a person might touch. What happens if that person is walking on carpet or some other surface where they have static on their hand and then they touch that button? Well, if you're lucky, it gets shunted straight to ground and nothing bad happens. If you're unlucky, it gets shunted on pin two, goes to the microcontroller and finds its way through the circuit to ground, destroying your entire microcontroller. So what are some options? Well, ESD protection is really, it's a really finicky subject in that there's literally hundreds of different ways to solve it, both from a single component super cheap up to dedicated chips, sometimes multiple chips and multiple passives. There's no right answer. I'm gonna go over some here. You might have an idea that could work perfect that I don't mention. It's not about what's the best in all applications. It's what's best for a specific use case. Typically it comes down to what level of protection you need based on how expensive the solution can be. So I'm thinking we can start from kind of like the base level, what are the easiest and cheapest ways, and then kind of build on from that. But before we get into that, something that's really important to, to look at is kind of the internals of a microcontroller. Something that a lot of people might not realize is that virtually every microcontroller, and this is a PIC-16, will have inbuilt diodes that are on each IO pin that help protect from ESD events. So what happens if we have a super high voltage, say a couple, a couple thousand volts? So if it's a standard diode, it's reference to the uh, power rail of the microcontroller, say five volts. So this 2000 volt surge is obviously high enough to overpower that and in theory, it should completely protect the microcontroller. Now, what if there's a negative voltage spike of say 2000 volts? It's going to now get impacted by the low side diode, which is sitting at zero volts, and it should complete the circuit in this manner. So then why do we need ESD protection? Well, the biggest reason is these are tiny diodes that are on the silicone wafer of the chip. They're super weak, so they can burn up very easily and they don't have any current limiting built in. So even if they're able to withstand that voltage, if it's any amount of time, it's going to just burn up the diode anyway from the current and then allow that surge to get into the microcontroller. So one of the big keys when you're designing for ESD protection and uh, input output protect protection in general is you never want these two diodes to be used. You know that they're there, but your goal is to make that be the absolute last stand, the the last uh, resort that protects the microcontroller. One of the first couple things I'll mention is a way that we can help these, but still rely on them. And of course, I'm starting from the cheapest and worst protection method and then going up. So that's still not the greatest idea, but it can be an option. So here's our connector. We have just input output. One of the easiest methods that we can do to prevent a ESD surge, and this is also the case with a lot of um, input output protection in general, is simply add a series resistor. This is useful in a ton of ways, and it's something that if your power dissipation allows, I say you should almost always have a series resistor. If you are to make it even just a low value, say 220 ohms, and do nothing else, what this allows is now on our diode array here, we now have that current limited through these, and it gives them a much better chance of dissipating that surge. 
It also helps with ringing and it can help with overcurrent both if this input is sinking or if it's sourcing as an output. So it's an extra quarter of a penny to add on and it gives you some sort of protection. The next thing that you can add is add a capacitor on the output side of your resistor and you form a simple RC circuit. Again, the values vary, it depends on the speed of the input or output signal you're driving. Um, it can be anywhere from 10 nanofarads down to a couple hundred picofarads. If you're driving a, if it's just a simple on off input, you can get away with being a much bigger cap. Typically with this setup, you're always going to benefit from a bigger capacitor if you can get away with it. Because if we have a big input surge of a high voltage, that gives this capacitor that much more capacity to absorb that impact. Also with this, you typically will want to have a resistor on the input side. You can keep this one here or get rid of it because now the resistor helps limit the current that goes into the capacitor and can help protect that capacitor. An RC also is really helpful when it comes to lowering the rise time of your signals. In that case, you would want to have the resistor on the input side. You can keep this one here because now with an RC, you limit how fast this signal can go up to a value of five volts and down to a value of zero volts, which helps with EMC compliance. So now the next option, which you will see done quite often, is having a what's called a TVS diode that is shunted to ground and is reversed biased. All a TVS diode is, and you can tell by the picture, is it's a Zener diode. The difference with this compared to a Zener is these respond super fast because if there's an ESD event, of course, you care way more about this reacting quickly than its continuous current carrying capacity. As that explanation dictates, if there is a very high or very long over voltage event, you can still burn up this TVS diode. So again, and this is going to be a common theme, is having a series resistor will help to alleviate the amount of current that goes into this TBS diode. Again, say 220 ohms, that's just a standard low value. So now we have the TBS diode to help with the over voltage and the resistor helps to protect that TBS diode. So the next option is to use a dual shot key diode array. So there is no reverse biasing going this way because it doesn't have a reverse breakdown. So if we have a high voltage, it will shunt to the five volt rail. If we have a negative voltage, it will go around from the ground side. This is typically the configuration that I like to use for most scenarios if cost isn't a huge issue, because what this does is essentially mimics what is on the microcontroller input. And since what's on the microcontroller or in the microcontroller are standard diodes, since we use a shot key diode, which has a lower voltage threshold, these will activate before the microcontrollers and the microcontroller will never see that. Again, the 220 volt resistor is still necessary because it helps limit the current that goes through the shot key. The reason I like this better than a TVS diode because they're rated not only for peak current, but also continuous. So this makes for a great over voltage and over current protection on top of an ESD protection. And of course, with this one, you can still always add a capacitor on the output side or on the input side and gain some additional filtering from that capacitor. So now the last method I'm gonna show is in the integrated circuit approach. Now again, there's a ton of these that are out there, but this is made by Borns and it's a, uh, a MOSFET based technology, which worked pretty well. These are typically only used 
if you know why you're using it. They are pretty expensive. They're overkill for almost all applications. But again, if you know you need it, then you probably should use it. Uh, we've used them on RS-485 lines that are super long that need to be completely bulletproof. And again, you would typically use this in conjunction with another method downstream. And what they are is, again, it's an integrated circuit. So it basically does within its uh, internal silicone, if there's a over voltage or over current event, it will completely disconnect the load. What is really cool about these is you can spec them for input voltages and a current. So that one chip acts essentially as a resettable fuse and an ESD over voltage chip. So they are great, they're pretty expensive, but if you have an application for it, and again, there's tons of these out there, I'm just picking one that I've used in the past. So those are a few of the common methods that I've used in the past and that are pretty common in the industry to help with ESD events. This is only on the schematic side. The PCB side is arguably just as important. I only wanna mention a couple things about that because typically it's related to just having a good layout. You don't wanna have a lot of ground loops. You don't wanna have anything where if this signal does get on, it's able to spread throughout the board. The one really important thing is all of this circuitry has to be as physically close to this connector as possible. You cannot put this whole section right next to the microcontroller. I mean, you can, but you're essentially wasting the majority of your effort doing it. Because because if this connector is super far away from here, you now are allowing a 2,000, 3,000 volt surge go all through your traces, all on your board, potentially arcing to other components before it finally gets to your protection circuitry. So when I do a board where we have uh, ESD protection, which they pretty much all do, you wanna basically treat all of this as connected to that connector and keep them as physically close as possible. So I hope this video was helpful. I know it just kinda scratched the surface, but I'm trying to keep these videos in this series fairly short. If you have any suggestions for future videos, please let me know and I will see you in the next one.